Benjamin Franklin, Citizen, Act Two. The scene is Franklin's sitting room in Paris in the early 1780s. It is an elegant room furnished with a substantial Louis XVI desk and chair, opulent wine decanters and candelabras, a plum-colored love seat, and an exquisite side table which, when uncovered, becomes Franklin's glass harmonica, a popular 18th century musical instrument. Resting on an adjoining chair is a lovely old guitar. Franklin enters wearing an auspicious fur hat. He has aged a great deal and leans on a Malacca walking stick, gout-ridden, troubled with pleurisy, but as high-spirited as ever. Ah, Madame de Lafayette had a baby daughter the other day. I hope she and the Marquis have 13 children. If they have 13 children, they could name them after the colonies. Miss Georgiana, Miss Carolina, and Miss Virginia sound pretty enough for the girls, but perhaps Massachusetts and Connecticut would be too awkward for the boys. Unless they were savages, of course. <laughs> Imagine, Massachusetts de Lafayette. <laughs> Apropos of children, I see that people are now experimenting with balloons here in Paris. I think this balloon may possibly give a new turn to human affairs as well. Convincing sovereigns of the folly of war might be one effect of it. Just imagine, 5,000 balloons capable of raising two men each could not cost more than five ships of the line. And where is the prince who can so afford to cover his country with troops for its defense as that 10,000 men descending from the clouds might not, in many places, create a great deal of mischief? Well then, someone asked me recently, what good is a balloon? Oh, I said? Well, in truth, sir, what good is a newborn baby? Hmm. A lady friend of mine went up in a balloon the other day. She was very brave to rise so high. And she was very kind, being so near the heavens, not to leave us and stay with the angels. She told me, however, that she would be my wife in paradise, on condition that I did not ogle the maidens there too much while waiting for her. <laughs> Madam, I told her, surely you know that the only effective way to get rid of a temptation is to satisfy it. But questions like these, what good is a balloon, then, have led me to believe that when a man's a public figure, he's fair game for all the carping and nagging that goes with that life. It often takes a certain stature and honesty from his compatriots to stand and be counted. And John Jay did that for me. It wasn't easy for him. Jay was by nature very reserved and not given to excesses. He was seldom even enthusiastic. But when we finally met here in Paris, he said, Oh, Franklin, my constitution doesn't promise a long life or I'd ask when you ascend to drop me your mantle. Oh, it gives me great pleasure, Jay, seeing our affairs in such good hands in Spain. Yes, I'm getting on. How I wish you might succeed me here. Oh, there'd be no point in asking. The lack of news from America is distressing. I have to get my information from the Spanish. Oh, and I suffer with you, Jay. I only know what I read in the papers or get from the French. Do you know it was Virgen himself who told me that Congress had refused my request for retirement? Retire? You? But you can't. Why? Haven't you heard the slanders about me at home? That I was not strong nor stern enough at the treaty table? That I was ready to give away America's fishery and boundary rights? Oh, Jay, Jay, I've, I've spent nearly 50 years of my life in public office, and I still have one ambition left, to carry fidelity to the grave with me. I can't suffer these accusations. It's almost treason in our country. Franklin, dear fellow, don't trouble yourself. But who would spread such malicious gossip, Jay? Who? Well, there are petty men in this world, you know. Jealous men. Over-ambitious men. Yes, I know, I know. I've suffered them at home and in London. They accused me of promoting the Stamp Act. That I wanted the colonies to suffer, and then I'd look a proper hero after I worked out the repeal. Can one fathom such things? And now this. Oh, it really is insufferable. Oh, what does it matter, Franklin? 
You showed a strong and steady hand at the treaty. We got all the territory as far as the Mississippi because of you. We got the right to navigate on that river because of you. No, no, we were unanimous, you and Adams and I. Ah, uh, but tell me, why are the Spaniards so futile? I've been trying for four years now to get them to say whether or not they'll help us. I don't even have the money to pay my butcher in Madrid. Well, Jay, there are only three ways for a nation to get wealth. The first is by war, as the Romans did, plundering their neighbors. This is robbing. The second is by commerce, which is usually cheating. The third is by agriculture, the only honest way, where a man receives a real increase of the seed thrown into the ground in a kind of continual miracle. <laughs> Continuing miracles. There's so much lying and self-aggrandizement in the world today, is it any wonder that people are always seeking the truth? Aha, but which truth, eh? One that serves one's immediate needs or a lasting universal truth? For example, people want to know what is truth in education, what is truth in religion. Indeed, they even want to know what is truth in love. Now, speaking of that noteworthy topic, I had a letter recently from a romantic young man. Very romantic indeed. I told him that I knew of no medicine fit to diminish the violent inclinations, he mentioned. Marriage, I told him, is the proper remedy. An unmarried man is like a half a pair of scissors. If you get a prudent, healthy wife and with industry in your profession, you will have a fortune sufficient. But if you persist in thinking a commerce with the sex inevitable, then I must repeat that in all your amours you should prefer old women to young ones. And my reasons are these. One... They have more knowledge of the world. Their minds are better stored with observations, and their, their conversation is more lasting and pleasantly agreeable. And two, when women cease to be handsome, they study to be good. They learn a thousand services, small and great, and are the most tender and useful friends when you are sick. Hence, there is hardly an old woman who is not a good woman. Well, hardly ever. And three... Because there is no hazard of children, which irregularly produced may be attended with much inconvenience. And four, in every animal that walks upright, the deficiency of the fluids in the muscles appears first in the highest part. The face grows lank and wrinkled, then the neck, then the breast and arms, all the rest remaining plump unto the last. So that covering all above with a basket, and regarding only what is below the girdle, it is impossible of two women to know an old one from a young one. And as in the dark all cats are gray, the pleasure of corporal enjoyment with an old woman is at least equal and frequently superior to that of a young woman, every knack being by practice capable of improvement. Making a young girl miserable may give you frequent bitter reflections, none of which can attend the making an old woman happy. And fifth and lastly, young man, they are so grateful... <laughs> uh, oh dear people also write to know my views on education well educating youth has been esteemed by wise men in all ages as the foundation of both good families and of governments although living on in one's children is a good thing I suppose I cannot help fancying that it might be better to continue living ourselves at the same time the real tragedy of course is the folly of those parents who, blind to their children's dullness and insensible to the solidity of their skulls, because their purses can afford it, manage to send them to all the temples of higher learning, where for lack of a suitable talent they learn no more than how to enter a room genteely or walk handsomely, which they could have learned in any dancing school. They return from these temples of learning as great blockheads as ever, only more proud and self-conceited. <laughs> uh, conceit. Now there is a quality in which the British are not lacking. One of their worthier types has been baiting me for years about America's lack of tradition. When an American has nothing better to do, he said, he can always try to trace his grandfather's ancestry. 
Yes, I told him. And when an Englishman has nothing better to do, he can always try to find out who his father was. <laughs> now, I am not a Quaker, as many have thought, although I've been to a, a number of their meetings. A young lady got up at one of these meetings and cried out that she'd been converted. Many a time she'd been in the arms of the devil. Only last night, she said, I was in the arms of the devil. But tonight I'm in the arms of faith and hope. Just then a voice at the back shouted, And how are you fixed for tomorrow night? <laughs> well, um, nature, you know, reflected on the placement of the elbow with great care. Some animals drinking water from the ground were given long legs, but also long necks and tongues, so that they might drink without kneeling. But man, destined to drink wine, must carry his glass to his mouth. Imagine, if the elbow had been placed close to the hand, thusly, it would be impossible to drink. Or if the elbow were closer to the shoulder, the arm would be too long and the glass would end up out here in space. And we are tantalized. But we have, for our ease, the elbow put in just the right place. Ah. Hmm. Speaking of the English as we were just now, I am reminded that during my lengthy stay in London, I was a guest one evening at a dinner for some scholars. The conversation turned to the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy, and a, a Baconite turned and asked me to commit myself. Oh, I don't know, I said. I, I think I'll wait until I get to heaven and ask Shakespeare who did write his plays. I don't think, Dr. Franklin, said this Baconite, that you'll find Shakespeare in heaven. Oh, I said. Very well, then you ask him. Now, people have always talked a great deal about the Ten Commandments. Now, I have been taught that there were twelve. The first should have been that you should increase and multiply and replenish the earth. The twelfth is that you should love one another. That's odd. The twelfth should have been first. <laughs> Oh, dear. In this matter of religion, Sunday school in my youth in Boston was a trying time. Trying indeed. We had two boys in our class who were the despair of everyone. We also had a kindly teacher, Mr. Brown, who one Sunday gave an assignment to learn a verse from the Bible. The following week, all the pupils came through beautifully. But when Mr. Brown turned to Willie, the first bad boy, and asked, Now, Willie, what verse have you learned? The boy muttered, I don't know any verse. Oh, come now, Willie, Mr. Brown said. Surely you can recite something from the Bible, no matter how small. Oh, all right, Willie told him. And Judas went and hanged himself. Hmm, said the perplexed Mr. Brown. That is rather small, but it, it's from the Bible. I guess I'll accept that. Then he turned to the second boy, Ephraim. What have you learned for me, son? Ephraim stared at him and said, Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Our Mr. Brown was imbued with kindness to animals, and one Sunday he said, Now suppose one of you saw a bad boy cutting off a cat's tail. What would you say from the Bible that would show him he was doing wrong, eh? And Willie cried out, What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. <laughs> oh, dear. These views on the afterlife, on religion in general, seem to scandalize everyone in Boston. Everyone but my father, that is. I suppose you'd like to know what sort of man my father was, eh? Well, he was of little stature, well set and strong. He had a pair of marvelously ingenious hands. He could make anything. And when he played on his violin and sang, it was very agreeable. He was often consulted by the leading citizens for his advice and counsel, and he never failed to introduce some useful topic at table. My mother... My mother was his second wife, and he had in all 17 children. I was the 15th and the last boy. Well, after I'd fought so much with my brother James, to whom I had been apprenticed as a young printer and I'd run away to Philadelphia, I went back to see them all. Ten months later. Father and I took a walk on the eve of my return to Philadelphia. It was a very momentous occasion. Hey, Ben, 
And tomorrow's the last day. Yesterday we were feeding fond hopes, my boy. You were to be great man, and I was to be happy father. Who knows when we'll meet again, son? Who knows? Well, religion tells us we will. Lay hold of religion, boy. Many people here in Boston think I never had any religion, father. Do you remember the time you were salting the pork in the barrel and I told you to say grace over it all at once that we'd save a lot of time that way? Ha, ha, ha. Ah, Shaw Ben, such a trifle as that. Well, somebody's inserted it in the Boston newsletter and it's been recalled to my discredit. Well, it doesn't matter if you got true religion, Ben. Aye, Father, true religion. True religion. But religion, as some of these people call it, I never had it, nor do I wish to. It's a religion of gloomy forms and notions, scaring everybody to death. It has no tendency to make men good and happy. So, son, you, you make man's happiness the end of religion, eh? Our catechisms teach that God's glory is the end. Well, it's the same thing, Father. All wise workmen place their glory in the perfection of their works. God has his ends in making man. Why is this still such a noble world? Yes, even still, filled with so much beauty, if not for man's happiness. Well, you think it pleases me, Ben, but what's your idea, true religion, then? It's greater than all the others, that's all. It puts power and wisdom into motion. Power and wisdom can do anything, but it's benevolence that takes care they shall do nothing but good. Look, Father, the sun could have been further off or closer to us, but then we could have froze to death or been scorched. The winds could be much stronger, but then no tree would stand or ship could sail. Fish could have been the size of whales and birds the size of condors, but God's benevolence made all these for man's convenience. Yeah, Ben, but... Uh... What do we to do without faith? Oh, I don't know much about faith, Father. I don't love the fig leaf. You don't love what? What in tarnation you talking about? The, the Bible says that when Adam lost the true image of God, his moral goodness, instead of trying to get it back, he went around and sewed fig leaves together to, to cover himself with. Stick to the point, Ben. That is the point, Father. People build God great temples. They make great sacrifices. This is their fig leaf. And the biggest fig leaf of all is faith. I'm only talking about those hypocrites who abuse it. Christ said, If ye repent and mend your ways with love and good works, ye shall be saved. But too many people overlook love and good works and fix upon faith alone as their salvation. Faith without love and good works is dead. The Bible tells us so. Well, I'm glad you took to the printing trade, Ben, because I don't think you'd ever gotten a license to preach. I may never be a Christian in name, Father, but I, I hope to become one in nature. Eh? <laughs> I'm sure you will, son. I'm sure you will. You know, Father, if we were as industrious to become good as we are to become great, we should become really great by being good. It's a big mistake to think about greatness without goodness. There never was yet a truly great man who wasn't truly virtuous. Hmm. Now, the advantages of possessing virtue after learning the means of obtaining it are quite different from the mere exhortation to be good, which doesn't tell you how. Many departments of our national life give evidence of the odds against which honesty and goodness are pitted of the ground that's been yielded, of the loss of character we have suffered because of these recessions. We should take off the shelf these homely virtues to rededicate ourselves to them as an essential tool of life. But throughout all my activities, I did not want to forget music. Oh, I love music. I can't sing well, but I, I do love it. Hmm. I'm learning to play the guitar as well as the harp and the violin. I've even written a song about my wife. I call it My Plain Joan. Will you try rhyming, Deborah? Of their Chloe's and Phyllis's poets may prate, I sing My Plain Country Joan. These many years, my wife, still the joy of my life. 
Blessed day that I made her my own Dear friends, blessed day that I made her my own Not a word of her face, of her shape, of her hair Or of flames or of darts you shall hear I beauty admire, but virtue I prize That fades not in seventy years Dear friends, that fades not in seventy years Some faults have we all, and so has my Joan But then they're exceedingly small And now I've grown used to them So like my own I scarcely can see them at all, dear friends I scarcely can see them at all Now we've had quite a new musical vogue here in Europe lately People fill glasses with different levels of water And play tunes upon them with knives or spoons Or they rub their wet fingers around the edges to get sounds I've had some glasses especially made Only the tops of wine glasses actually I ran a spindle through them, connected it to this foot pedal, and set the whole affair in this wooden frame. The glasses, as you see, are painted to signify various notes. There's a water trough inside to keep them wet, and moving the pedal thusly, I'm able to play my glass harmonica. This instrument's been very popular here in Europe, although it has never caught on in America. Even young Mozart has written music for it. This is an adagio by Mozart that I'm playing now. Hmm. You know, in the best of the old songs, the music was simple. It conformed itself to the usual pronunciation of words and never disguised or confounded the language by making a, a long syllable short or a short one long. Modern songs, on the contrary, neglect all the beauty and propriety of common speech and in their place raises up their defects and absurdities as so many graces. Oh, if ever it was the ambition of musicians to make instruments that sound like the human voice, that ambition is now reversed. The human voice sounds like an instrument. Thus it was that wigs were first made to imitate natural hair. But when they became fashionable, we now find natural hair dressed to look like wigs. <laughs> well... Human reasoning is a very uncertain thing because two people can arrive at diametrically opposed positions from the same premise. Consequently, reason appears to me a very blind guide. I think a good sure instinct would be worth a great deal more. And I've known many good people in my time, people of good instincts, sure and true. One of these was Madame Helvetius, Yes, there was one more lady. Oh, yes, I know what's going through your minds. Oh, that old goat really kicked up his heels, didn't he, eh? Oh, yes, it's all true what we hear about him, eh? <laughs> well, I like ladies. I like kissing their necks. As for kissing their lips and cheeks, it is not the custom here in France. The first is considered rude, and the other might rub off the paint. But with this one... There was no politics, no English spies, no intrigues or suspicions or reticence. Just mutual confidence and trust and love. Oh, <laughs> but why haven't you been to see me for such a long time, Papa Franklin? We passed so few days together. I am waiting, Helvetia, until the nights are longer. Uh, one hopes, madame, that you will have merriment at your house when I have my picture painted there. Amuse me, or you will have a very sad picture. Oh, papa, great good fortune without prudence is a great misfortune. Well, madame, if you would have your guests be merry with cheer, be so yourself, or so at least appear. Ah, ha, ha, papa, to err is human, to repent divine, to persist devilish. Oh, very good, Helvetia. <laughs> um, clean your finger before you point at my spots. <laughs> Wonderful, Papa Franklin. Wonderful. You know you are my favorite. Of all those gay fools who gather at my Chateau de Toya, you are the favorite. We find in your company that we are not only pleased with you, but pleased with one another and so with ourselves. 
Well, Papa, I find that people are apt to go strange and not understand one another when they meet but seldom. I find that I love company, a glass of wine, a song as well as ever. I do not tell you that I love you, Helvetia. I might be told there was nothing strange or meritorious in that because the whole world loves you. I only hope that you will love me a little. Ah, oh, Papa. We shall meet in the next world, Papa Franklin, with all those who love us best. I, a husband, and you a wife? But I believe you are a rogue and will find more than one. <laughs> How odd that you should mention that world, Havisha. Just last night I dreamt I was transported to the Elysian fields. Who would you speak with, they asked me. Socrates and Helvetius, I said. But since I know not a word of Greek, let me see Helvetius first. Well, he received me graciously. He asked me a thousand questions about the war, about religion, about the government of France. Oh, sir, I said, you do not ask after your wife. She still loves you devotedly. Oh, he sighed, I have another wife now. She's not as pretty as the first, it's true, but she serves me just as well. But, sir, I said, your wife has been faithful to you. She has turned down my hand in marriage many times. And just then the second Madame Helvetius entered, and I recognized my own wife, Deborah Franklin. Madam, I said, I am here to reclaim you. She drew herself up coldly and said, <laughs> I made you a good wife for 49 years, nearly half a century. Let that content you. I am here for an eternity. So, Helvetia, I have returned to the earth to see the sun in you. Here I am. Let us avenge ourselves. <laughs> oh, Papa Franklin. Cher, cher Papa Franklin. Among the felicities of my life, I count your friendship, which shall remain as long as that life shall last. Mon cher Papa, I like to believe that you are happy. You must be happy, Papa Franklin. Be happy. Be happy. No, wait, Helvetia. Wait. We loved and still loved one another. It is too early yet to part. Let us sit in the evening of life together. The last hours are always the most joyous. Wait, Helvetia. Wait. Wait! Wait! Unhappily, the rapport I had with these people, even some of my bitterest enemies, I did not have with my own son, William. My son, William. William, as has been noted, was appointed governor of New Jersey by the British, and he arrived with his new wife, a beautiful English girl from the West Indies, on February 19th, 1763, to take up his royal duties. They made a handsome couple. I accompanied them to Perth Amboy in New Brunswick, and William took his oath, the troops paraded, the crowds cheered, and yet... Yet I was filled with a melancholy I'd never known before. He still seemed as devoted as ever but his eyes. William's eyes were cold. No warmth ever came from them. But I am a gentleman, father, he'd say. When I would reply, yes, my son, and I am a tradesman, he would simply dismiss the entire conversation with an exquisite shrug. Back in those early days when I first introduced him to the Pennsylvania Assembly, the rules forbade the sons of artisans be admitted. One of the members called out, Franklin, Franklin, don't you know that your son is not eligible here? Would you gentlemen bar Jesus Christ, the son of a carpenter, I asked? William was admitted. His romance with the poetess Elizabeth Graham had ended quite suddenly because Mrs. Graham said that she'd heard stories about my son and... Dr. Graham forbid their marriage. So I was obliged to take him to London with me. It was not an altogether wise decision. I've done the assembly reports as you've asked, Father, and sent the statements off to David Hall. But really, 
Must we constantly have these tradespeople underfoot? I am a tradesperson, William. Yes, as you are so fond of reminding us. The penniless youth, the hard struggle, it is an enchanting tale. Then hit it again! William Strawn is a friend of mine. He is a printer and an Englishman. Peter Collinson is a friend of mine. He is a noted scientist. Oh, Father, please. This middle-class morality is stifling. Why? Oh, I let it pass. What was the use? He was nearly 27 now and hardly going to change. He was studying law in London and helping me serve Pennsylvania as well as several other colonies. And he was doing quite well. In addition, he was courting my landlady's daughter, Polly, and both Mrs. Stevenson and I were pleased because Polly... Oh, Polly was a fascinating girl, an exemplary child. But then one day in 1760, he came to me with a very strange tale indeed. What? What do you mean you're presenting me with a grandson? Polly is not the sort of... Oh, do be still and listen, won't you, Father? I did not mention Polly. I simply said I am to be the father of a child. Must I draw you pictures? But, William, don't you realize the stigma attached to this? Who is the girl? I can't tell you. You must tell me. I cannot. You must tell me, William. And I have told you no. I cannot. But this does me no great honor. Oh, and is honor now the goal of the working class? And my birth, sir. Was it attended as a great joyous occasion? Was it? Was it? Touché, William. Touché. I returned home to Philadelphia in 1762, and he arrived some months later as the governor of New Jersey. I had hoped our differences might be resolved. Alas, my hopes were unfounded. No, no, no! England is the sovereign here in America. England! Do you understand? England! And I tell you, Mr. William Governor Franklin, that only the king is sovereign here and not that venal parliament. Oh, it was hopeless. I returned to London shortly after and was soon stripped of my duties as postmaster for North America. I was watched, followed, and harassed as the storm clouds drew closer by the month. You hear from others, I wrote to William, of the treatment I am receiving. I leave you to your conscience to reflect upon it. His reply was blunt and to the point. And I, sir, have decided for royalty. The king can do no wrong here. Why don't you return to America and spend a peaceful old age among the friends and admirers who love you so? Oh, the gall, the unmitigated gall. I finally did return to America on May 7th, 1775, accompanied by his young son called William Temple Franklin, a bright lad. Once more, I went to New Jersey to see His Excellency. William, William, you must give up this royal post nonsense and take up some useful occupation, like, like agriculture, for example. Apparently, Father, you do not know the meaning of the word honor. I have sworn allegiance to the crown. And I, sir, have faith in my country. You are fomenting treason, Mr. Tradesman, and I will have none of it. But this is your country, William. You were born here. You have filial obligations to me, to your son, to your country. Think of these things. My obligations, sir, are on a higher plane. And now, if you will excuse me, I have important affairs of state to attend to. Good day. Billy! Billy! Oh, Billy... Does your excellency mean that much to you? He was struck with disaster after that. A letter sympathetic to England that he'd written fell into the hands of the New Jersey Assembly and he was promptly arrested and sent into exile to London. We only saw each other once again, nearly 10 years later. I was finally on my way home from Paris the boat docked at Southampton, and he came down from London to greet me. We met on board the ship. Hello, Father. Hello, William. Oh, my. Oh, 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 oh. oh, my. Let me look at you. Father? Yes, William. Father, I... I am sorry, sir. 
I'm sorry for all the grief and the shame. Oh, there's no grief, William, no shame, only regret. But even that too shall pass in time, for this America will grow and prosper like nothing the world has ever seen before, William. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Father? Yes. Yes, William? Goodbye, Father. Goodbye. Goodbye, William. Goodbye. 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 Billy. Billy. Yes, gentlemen, yes. There are some parts of this Constitution I do not approve of, but I am not sure I shall never approve of them. The older I grow, the more I doubt my own judgment and pay attention to the judgment of others. But I agree to this Constitution because I think a, a general government necessary for us. History is full of the heirs of states and princes. The best measures of statesmanship are seldom adopted from previous wisdom, but forced by the occasion. And now, such an occasion, such an occasion. But then when you get together a number of people to take advantage of their wisdom, of course, you get all their passions, their prejudices, their errors, and their selfish views. Can a perfect production be expected from this? I am astonished to find it approaching so near perfection as it does. Yes. Yes, I consent, sirs, to this Constitution because I expect no better. And I am not sure it is not the best. Well, well, now I, I must quit this scene, but you, dear friends, dear friends, will live to see our country grow and prosper like a field of young corn which long fair weather and sunshine had enfeebled and discolored and by a thunder gust of violent wind, hail, and rain seemed to threaten with absolute destruction. But the storm once being passed, it will recover with double vigor and delight the eye not of its owner only, but of every observing traveler. <laughs> God grant that not only the love of liberty, but a thorough knowledge of the rights of man may pervade all nations of the earth so that a philosopher may put his foot anywhere on its surface and say, this, this is my country. <laughs> ah. We were long fellow laborers in the best of all works, the work of peace. I leave you still in the field. But having finished my day's task, I'm, I'm going home to bed. Wish me a good night as I do you a a pleasant evening. Adieu. Adieu. Adieu.